Folks, uh, let's pray for just a moment. Gracious Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Lord, bless the words and the message and make them yours. Let your spirit speak and do not let me be the stumbling block between you and your people. And we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen indeed. Well, it's a great honor for me to be here. I really appreciate the invitation to come and share the word with you for a little bit this morning. I uh, have known both of your pastors actually for a long time. Pastor Mark and I met actually in, uh, in summer Greek at seminary many, many years ago. And so we sat across tables from each other going, what does that mean? And we would say, I don't know, it's all Greek to me. And, <laughs> and we thought we were the first seminary students that ever thought that joke up. So, and, uh, and then my first call into ministry was into Iowa District West where uh, Pastor Ron had been for a long time as well. So I got to know him pretty well. Uh, there also, so uh, I really appreciate the, the the chance to come and share the word with you a little bit, and and you guys are richly blessed with your pastoral leadership, and uh, and boy, the musicians as well, fantastic. I really uh, uh, love the the voices that uh, you bring to bring praise to the Lord. So, for a moment here, what I want to do is is share a little story with you, a true story that I experienced in in what I referred to now as my previous career. Uh, before I went to the seminary, I worked for a long time in the film and video production business, and mostly in Iowa, but we shot stuff all over the place, and so I had a chance to work on lots of feature films and TV movies and commercials and documentaries and other kinds of things, pretty much everything you can, you can think of. And uh, uh, in that field of work, one of the movies that I got to work on was a movie called Twister. Anybody ever see Twister or heard of Twister? It was a fun movie to work on. It shot partially in Oklahoma, but mostly in, in uh, Iowa, in uh, some of the areas just outside of Ames, Iowa. So I got to work on that film, and if you've never seen that film, well, the, the quick synopsis of the story basically is uh, there's a group of scientists, they're meteorologists, and they're trying to do some research on storms and stuff, tornadoes, they're trying to research these things and get a better handle on how they work and what we might be able to predict and so on. And so there's actually two kind of competing science teams, and, and they have developed this kind of gizmo that they call Dorothy, and it's this barrel-sized thing that's full of these little balls that have little radio transmitters in them, and, and, and what they want to do is deploy this thing in front of a tornado, let the tornado suck this thing up, and then the balls will spin around, and they, they transmit uh, data back to their computers and so on. And, uh, so that's what they're trying to do. So basically, most of the movie is uh, the heroes of the story. They race in front of tornadoes, try to deploy the thing, and then try to get away from the tornado. And the tornadoes are always the bad guys, and so most of the movie, they're big action all kinds of destruction and mayhem and, and just all kinds of devastation that these storms leave in their wake. And so for me, it was 15 weeks of just fun and, fun and games watching how the special effects were done and watching all the uh, blowing things up and the destruction that they would do for these things. So, and now in the, in the movie, if you've seen it, you might re recall there's a, there's a moment in the film where this uh, the, a tornado has picked up a semi-tanker truck and is kind of hurling it through the air. And what's going to happen in this film is, in this scene, is the tanker truck will come crashing down on the highway right in front of the heroes. The heroes are always driving a red Dodge Ram pickup truck, and this is the ultimate commercial for Dodge Ram pickup trucks because they can drive through any kind of destruction and mayhem and fireballs and keep on going. And in reality, they destroyed about 19 of those trucks making the movie. <laughs> but in the movie, it's the same truck. And so this tanker truck's going to crash on the ground. It's going to smash and big fireball. And they're going to race through the fireball and keep on going. So I got to be there on the set on the day when they're going to they're gonna film this big explosion. And so we get there. And uh, there's about 150 of us that are on the crew that have absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with this scene or this, uh, the special effects. There is no particular reason that any of us really needed to be on set other than there's going to be a big explosion. And that transported a lot of us back to junior high school or something. We were just excited to see this thing happen. So we get there, and uh, we're, we're uh, checking this whole place out. And it's a, it's a farm field that's outside of Ames, Iowa, a little ways. And so what's happened, the special effects company, it's a company called Industrial Light and Magic, ILM. They're kind of the biggest of the big in special effects in, 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 uh, in Hollywood. Well, they have uh, built a, a life-size fabricated semi-tanker truck. And it is 
packed to the hilt full of explosives, and it's suspended from a, a, a large crane. It's a good hundred yards or more up off of the ground. There's this large crane, and there's a cable down, and there's an explosive bolt, and then this life-size tanker truck. So what'll happen is they can explode this bolt, and the thing will come flying down, and it's going to explode in a huge ball of flames. Now, all around, they've got uh, cameras strategically positioned, and the cameras are all inside these plate iron boxes to protect the cameras and the camera operators that are with them as well. They're going to, you got one shot at this thing, so they're going to film it from several different angles and, and all of that. Well, the rest of us, the 150 people who are just there to gawk, <laughs> we're just kind of standing off to the side of the field. We don't know for sure where we're supposed to be. But there's this one guy who's one of the main special effects guys, and he's kind of walking around, you know, calculating stuff. And he's this shorter, kind of mousy looking guy with the Buddy Holly glasses and the ball of tape on the corner and the pocket protector and the whole thing. I mean, he really looks the part. And he's walking around with a calculator and he's just kind of you know, keeps calculating stuff, the amount of explosives and how far it's going to fall and you know, the, how far will the debris field go. And he's, he's just, I, we don't know what all he's calculating, but he's pretty intense about the whole thing. He calculates everything. And then finally, he puts a stake in the ground at the point of impact where it's going to be. And he's got a long string that he has very carefully measured off. And he measures it way out to a very precise spot. And then he takes the string and a can of spray paint and he spray paints this long arcing white line on the ground, right? And then he gathers this group of, of onlookers. He gathers us together, and he, he wants to kind of put the fear of God into us a little bit. And one thing you know, you, you learn on a movie set, you don't argue with the special effects guys. They own the set. Safety is their first priority, and you do not mess with these guys. They will throw you off of the set. So we're going to pay attention to what he says, but he really wants to put the fear of God into us. So he kind of gathers us and tries to put on his best angry voice, and he says, okay, here's the deal, right? This side you live, that side you die. Got it? We're like, okay, a little dramatic, all right, all right, we got it, we got it. He's like, no, I don't think you're understanding the magnitude of what I'm trying to say to you. I want you to understand this. This side you live, that side you die. I don't want to see one single toe come across this line. That side you live, that side you die. Got it? And we're like, okay, we got it, yeah, 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 we got it. And so he goes off to go about his business, and the rest of the crew, you know, we're all kind of going, gee, a little dramatic, isn't he? All right, this side you live, that side you die, we got it, all right. So we're all set, right? And my plan is, um, I, I have a camera that requires film, so the older folks would have to explain to the younger folks here <laughs> what that means. There's a roll of film you put in it and you only get so many shots. So my plan is, I'm gonna stand there and when this thing hits, I'm gonna just reel off this whole roll of film, just go choo, 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 and kind of get the progression of the fireball, right? And, and everybody else is doing the same thing. So it's time for the big moment. They get ready, you can hear the countdown starting. As Soon as they start counting down, we all put our toes on the line. <laughs> I'm not over the line. But I'm on the, we are all with our toes on the line and we're standing there. They count down three, two, one, boom, the bolt blows, this thing comes flying down, boom, just this incredible, massive mushroom cloud a fireball going up. The impact of the explosion hits us in the chest and just like knocks the wind out of you. So I'm standing there going, oh. And then I realize, oh, I'm supposed to be shooting my camera here. So I reel off this roll of film and we're watching. And it's out there in the countryside and you can just hear this thunderous roar going off through the, the farmland, the hillsides around us. And we're just mesmerized by this massive explosion and all that. And so the fireball kind of rolls off and fizzles out. And we're all standing there looking up in the sky. And all at the same time, we all suddenly look down at our feet and one foot inside the line, there is debris, pieces of metal and chunks of concrete and things all the way around. Not one thing came across the line, but a lot of things came within about a foot of the line and we all suddenly looked at it and all at the same time, 150 people suddenly went, 
wow, this side you live, that side you die. <laughs> he wasn't kidding. And I remember thinking, that guy is good at math. Man, I'll bet he had a scholarship or something. This guy was really good. But I'm standing there for a moment, and I'm sort of taking in the scene. I'm looking at this thinking, man, oh man, this side you live, that side you die. And I remember I thought to myself, there's a fine line between life and death. There's a fine line between eternal life and eternal death. And think about this. Uh, the guy had come to give us instructions. He gave us fair warning. He drew off the boundary line. Now, my sinful nature was tempted to just kind of touch my toe across the line. That sinful nature in me wanted to say, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Come on, all these instructions. You got to stand here. This side you live. That's, oh, yeah. My sinful nature could have lured me off to the wrong side of the line. But there I was on the side of life, getting to experience this amazing moment. The image of the debris so close to the line has stuck with me for all of these years. I keep thinking about that, and I've thought about it so many times as I've, uh, you know, later on I went into the seminary and we uh, began, you know, exploring the Bible in a new kind of way for the preaching and the teaching for the sake of God's people. And I remember one time I came across this moment. There's a moment in Exodus chapter 19. Now, by the time you get to Exodus chapter 19, uh, you've already had the 10 plagues and the Passover and the Exodus, and they crossed through the Red Sea, and they've made their way down to, the, uh, to Mount Sinai, and the, the people of Israel are encamped at the base of Mount Sinai, and Moses goes up to the top of the mountain, and a cloud descends, and God begins to speak to him, and, and God says this to him. God said, Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain will surely be put to death. Put a limit around. This is a moment when God literally commanded Moses to draw a line in the sand. There's a fine line between life and death. Here's the problem that they faced. Life is found in the presence of God, in the love, mercy, and grace of God. Life is found on the side of God. And yet they were stranded on the wrong side of the line. Now, God was not going to leave them there, so don't think that the story ends in Exodus 19 by any means. It's only the beginning. But God was demonstrating something for them. You are stranded on the wrong side of the line, and you do not just go marching into the presence of God. You're going to be welcomed into his presence, but on his terms and not yours. You know, the reality is we've all been stranded on the wrong side of the line. Since the fall from God's grace in the Garden of Eden, uh, when Adam and Eve disobeyed and fell from his grace, from that very moment on, we have all inherited this sinful nature within us. And this sinful nature, it will, it will drag us toward sinfulness. It'll drive us to sinfulness. It'll lead us. It'll lure us oh so subtly towards sinfulness in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds, in the things that we do and the things we leave undone. Our sinful nature will lure us off towards sinfulness and the wages of sin is death. And the sinful nature would have left us stranded on the wrong side of the line, hopeless and helpless and hell-bound, had it not been for the actions of God himself. And God had a plan all along. God knew what he was going to do. You see, he didn't want to leave us stranded on the wrong side of the line where, where we had no way to really approach him. And from that sinful nature, sometimes we like to think, well, maybe we can just barge on into the presence of God and start barking our, uh, our, our shopping list at him. Here are the things I need, Lord. You ever, you ever fall off into, the ditch of, uh, into that sort of ditch in your prayer life? Sometimes we, we barge on in on our own terms and we say, okay, God, here are the things that I think I need that are going to improve my life and, and, and I could use that job promotion. If you could you know, get on that, that would be terrific. I got this kind of achy thing. If you could just kind of get rid of that for me. And don't you see that guy? Man, he really needs converted to faith, doesn't he? Can you get on that, Lord? Anybody ever stumble into a prayer like that? The truth is, I think we all do at times when we find ourselves exhausted, we're tired, we're frustrated, we're suffering from grief or anxiety or fear, or whatever it might be, 
Sometimes we think we need to start barging into God's presence and barking our orders at him. Here's what I want you to know for a moment here. Uh, God does not take our orders. He's not a short order cook. He does not uh, respond to our commands. He does love some conversation with us and he certainly invites us into a life of prayer, but on his terms. There were the people of Israel on the wrong side of the line and God was about to give them his terms. In fact, uh, right after that moment, the, the next thing that God does is he literally chisels into stone uh, some of the rules, his design for the way our lives are supposed to be lived so that we can begin to get a sense of the magnitude of what it means to stand in the presence of God and to be welcomed and to be loved and to, uh, and to know that he is our father and we are his children. He began by giving us his design for life. So he said to Moses, take these stone tablets to the people and here's what they say. The first one says, don't have any other gods in my place. And God doesn't say that because he's egotistical or because he doesn't want to have competition from other gods. He, he loves us enough to let us know there are no other gods. Don't go chasing after the false gods. They're useless. They're, uh, they're, they're, they are powerless. They cannot do anything for you. They're fictitious characters. Don't have any other gods in my place. And then he said, uh, don't misuse my name. Instead, wear my name well. You're my children. I want you to wear my name well. And then he said, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. It's a day meant for the sacred assembly, God says, through his holy word. It's a time meant for this. And why do we come? Why do we gather? You know, God, this was God's idea in the first place. I want you to gather in a regular rhythmic life of worship, but we don't gather here for God's sake. We don't gather here to remind him that he's God. He already knows. Rather, he says, I want you to gather for your sake, God says, so that I can pour into you through my word and my sacraments. I want to pour into you. I want to re-energize you. I want to re redirect you. I want to be the lamp into your feet and the light into your path. I want, to, I want to walk with you. So it's for our sake that God invites us into his house. And then he says, oh, uh, those are the way we work and play well with God. And then he says, um, honor your father and your mother. Don't go around murdering each other. That's really a bad thing to do. Don't commit adultery and don't, uh, don't steal each other's stuff. Don't go telling lies. Don't covet your neighbor's stuff and don't covet your neighbor's relationships. This is how we work and play well with one another. This is God's design for life. And then God said, well, uh, what I want from you is that you keep my design for life to absolute perfection in every thought, in every word, in every deed. And to not keep his uh, laws to absolute perfection is to sin against God. And the wages of sin is death. And we cannot overcome it. So how you doing? Have you, have you maintained perfection so far? Are you really glad that the story doesn't end there either? Yeah. You see, God gave us his design for life because he knows our life goes better if we live in such a way, but he also knows we've got that sinful nature and it's going to lead us to sinfulness in our thoughts, words, and deeds, and sometimes we're going to think we can barge into his presence and command him around. God was saying, no, 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 here's my design for life, I do want you to pursue it. But you got a sinful nature, and I know you're going to stumble and fall in sinfulness and your thoughts, words, and deeds, and the wages of sin is death, but I will not leave you on your own. Through all the prophets of old, God gave us the great plan. He would send the Messiah, the Savior, the heaven-sent Savior would come from, uh, from, by God's own will. And so the Father sent the Son into mortal flesh and blood. And we celebrate his birth in the Christmas season, little town of Bethlehem. And we follow his journey through the seasons of Epiphany and, and uh, Lent. And, and eventually we get to Holy Week and we remember again just what it is that Jesus did for us all. Well, pretty late in his earthly journey, all the way back in Matthew chapter 25, that gospel reading that we heard today, Jesus shared a parable with us because he wanted us to understand the magnitude of what's really at stake here. And so this parable is a picture of judgment day when the king comes and there's a resurrection of the body and then a separation, he said. There are the sheep and the goats. There are the believers and the rejectors. And to one side, he says, come and receive the inheritance prepared for you. And to the other, he says, away from me, I never knew you. 
You see, on this side you live, and on that side you die. And that's what's really at stake here. He wanted to make sure that we understood just what really is at stake. Now, now what if uh, our sinful nature said, well, I don't believe he really knows what's good for me and the design for life, and he marked out a boundary line, I'm just going to tap my toe on the other side. The wages of sin is death. This sinful nature keeps trying to drag us to the wrong side of the line, and that's where we were stranded from the time of Adam and Eve to, uh, to the time when Christ finally came. We were hopeless. We were helpless. We were hell-bound. There was nothing we could do about it. But Jesus came. He told that parable, and you know what he did next? He lived out the fullness of his mission. He made his way to the city of Jerusalem. He rode a donkey in a triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem, and, and he spent the week preaching and teaching of his holy kingdom, and then finally, after he had given us that sacred gift that we still get to receive to this very day, he made his way into the Garden of Gethsemane, and there he was betrayed by one of his closest friends, <laughs> and he gave himself willingly into the hands of wicked men, and he endured the passion of the Christ Examine the passion scene at some point, would you? Uh, the, the crown of thorns and the mocking and the spitting and the ridicule and the, uh, the flogging that tore up his body and all that he suffered through. He was enduring the depth of the depravity of all mankind. Uh, that was when we saw just how sinful, fallen, broken mankind can really be. That such evil could be inflicted on another how far behind the line were we really stranded? And yet, while he endured the depth of the depravity of all mankind, he was also letting us know that his love is greater still. And he would march through the streets to a hilltop called Golgotha. And he would allow them to nail his body to a cross and hang him there until he died. As he was dying on that cross, he was atoning for our sins. He was uh, forgiving our sins. He was cleansing our very souls. He was winning forgiveness and new and eternal life for us. He died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. They wrapped him up and sealed him away in a tomb. And on the third day, he rose. He rose up victorious over sin and death and the power of the devil. And, and in the passion of the Christ, by his death and resurrection, do you realize what Jesus did? He crossed the line. Jesus crossed the line from life to death so that he could bring us from death into life. So that he could raise us up in new life by faith in him. So that we could stand on the side of life so that we could know that heaven is our home and that eternal life awaits us. He crossed the line from life to death to bring us from death to life. And here we are. You know, that same heaven-sent Savior, some years later, would actually inspire an apostle named Paul to write for us the words that appear in Ephesians chapter 2 in 10 simple verses. He summarizes the whole Christian faith. He summarizes it beautifully, especially, I believe, in this Lutheran view of the Christian faith. He, 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 he lets us know uh, where we were. You see, he says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live, and you follow the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. You were dead in transgressions and sins. You were stranded on the wrong side of the road, and it wasn't just those people then and there. He says, like the rest, we were all by nature objects of wrath. We were all in the same boat together. We were all stranded on the wrong side of the line and death was certain. Eternal death was certain. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. 
Once we were dead in transgressions and sins, but by the grace of God, because he is so rich in love and mercy, by his great grace, we have been saved. Grace, it literally means the gift. It's the gift of God. By grace, we have been saved. And it's it's not our own doing. He goes on to say, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is, not the, and this is the gift of God. It's not by works so that no one can boast. It's not by works. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. It wasn't our doing. We didn't get ourselves across the line. You know, sometimes people think, well, uh, I don't want to abide by that guy's rules. You know, the guy who's actually in charge, the one who measures out the very breath of life in your lungs right now. I don't want to abide by his rules. I'm going to get myself there. Let me tell you something. There is no amount of good works that you can do that eventually will allow you to drag yourself across the line. There is no amount of prayer that can be said. There is no no amount of money that you can pay. You cannot purchase the favor and, and blessing and the gift of God. But Jesus did it all. We are redeemed and restored to God's own family in Christ alone, by his great mercy and grace alone. And notice that it says it is by grace that you have been saved. It's a done deal right now with enduring results. That's a a reference to the language. You have to study the language and the use of the language in the scriptures. You have been saved. It's a done deal, paid in full. Jesus paid it all when he died and rose again and brought us from death to life. Now notice the last verse says, for we are God's workmanship. That other translation says, we are his masterpiece. I love that. We are his masterpiece. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You know, that he's got things in mind for us to do. We don't do these things so that we can somehow hopefully earn his favor and forgiveness and renewal and redemption. We do these things to express our gratitude because we have been saved. It's already a done deal. As we carry out the uh, the good deeds, the works uh, of the kingdom of God that he has in mind for us to do, you know what we do? We walk a fine line. We walk a fine line between life and death, between eternal life and eternal death. We walk that line as we continue to serve him, and along the way, you know what we do? We preach and teach and reach. We preach the word of God because his are the words of eternal life. We teach the biblical story to to young and old because Because God is at work in and through his word. It's the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. And he is continually guiding us on our way and leading us into the work of the kingdom. And eventually, a heavenly home. We preach and we teach and we reach. We reach out to the people who are hurting, who are hungry, who are in such need in so many ways as Jesus described. And when we do these things for the least of our brothers and sisters... We're doing them for him. We're doing these things to express our gratitude to Christ because he understood the magnitude of the moment, just what really is at stake. There's no neutral ground. Either there's life or there's death. And he sought to give us life. There's a great verse in John's gospel where Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. A lot of people terribly misread that verse and they think, well, that means what he came for is so that we could have money and stuff and a comfortable home. And that's what he really means. I came that they may have an abundant life. No, (laughs) I came that you may have life and have it to the full. That fullness of life will be really experienced in his own heavenly home. You know, as I stood there on that line back at the set that day, I remember asking myself a question. I I was taking it in and I was so, uh, uh, it made such an impression, such an impact on me (laughs) in more ways than one, I guess. I remember looking at that scene and I thought, 
There's a fine line between life and death. And then I thought to myself, where do you stand? Where do you stand in your relationship with God? Where do you stand in your relationship with Christ the Savior? Where do you stand? Well, God has blessed us richly through Christ our Savior, and because of him, here in the love of Christ, I stand. This side is life. Live in the life that he has raised you up to. Serve him with gladness and joy and appreciation. And invite others to rise up and live this new life in Christ. To him be the glory today and forever in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And may the peace of God which surpasses all of our understanding keep our hearts and minds in the one true faith in Christ Jesus our Lord until that day when he receives us home. Amen. Amen indeed.